Hi, yes. everybody. So if you could please mute your video and your audio. Pete just came in, Maisie, so we can. So I just want to introduce myself. Hi. OK, sorry, I let one more person in. I am Vanessa, and this is my son, John. And we are with the Fly Brave Foundation. We are located in Sacramento, California, and Fly Brave was started in 2016 when John was aging out of school and we went looking for continued supports and employment training and a social network and connection following aging out of school and we came up short. So we started the Fly Brave Foundation and we provide social services, fitness, life Life skills and employment training and we are so excited to announce that we have just moved into our first brick and mortar location it is going to be the fly brave emporium new and used gifts a take on a consignment store and it also has an attached coffee shop so it'll be an emporium and a coffee shop and it will serve as employment training for adults on the spectrum and we are so excited about that right john yeah. So John is also a runner. Many of you may know him, know his story. If you don't, he found running about five years ago and it just opened him up to a world of possibilities. And he's run several marathons, including the Boston Marathon. And he's going to run the Park City, Utah Marathon on May 1st, his first marathon back since the pandemic. Right. Yeah. Are you excited yeah. about the new workspace yeah. you've been there every day yeah yeah so that's who we are and i'm so excited to have Maisie and matt and patrick they have dynamic presentations for you today so we'll just kick it off and get started with Maisie. and so if we could all mute our audio and video that would be great Hi, everyone. So I am going to be the first presenter. My name is Macy Sutantio, and I am a proud, very proud neurodivergent. I was um, late diagnosed with autism and sensory processing disorders. And I also um, still have number dyslexia, dyscalculia. I also have a few other conditions commonly related to um, autism, um, including learning challenges, auditory processing difficulties, um, and so on. I um, am a longtime autistic specialist working with autistic kids and uh, for about 30 years now. And since I've been a long time uh, autism specialist. My little clients grew up. And um, even though they're very, very good with what they do with their knowledge, many of them actually graduated college. Um, the employability situation is still very, very difficult. For example, I have a young man who is a pizza connoisseur, loves making pizza, can make all kinds of pizza, but he couldn't even get a summer job at Domino's. So I just started thinking, you know, after all these work, since they were little and now they're young adults and all these wonderful partnerships that I've had with their parents and these young, young adults, um, I became very sad that the employability uh, it's not happening for them. That's why in 2019, I founded not the nonprofit Autism Career Pathways. And what we want to do is figure out the how to hire people who are more impacted by their autism, including non-speaking and minimally speaking autistic adults. I firmly believe that the world is missing out um, because autistic people are amazing and they're all on untapped talent. So tonight I will be presenting to you all an alternative career screening method. So I created uh, an alternative activity-based, skill-based uh, career screening tool to really um, 
be able to represent the best of each autistic job seekers. So our mission at Autism Career Pathways is to be able to empower businesses of all sizes to create, to be able to create a customizable hiring resources for small to medium sized businesses. I'm talking about the small mom and pop shops in our community, our laundry mat, printing companies, uh, real estate companies, law offices, you know, all these places that we have in our downtown and how do we really share with them you know uh, the strength of neurodivergent individuals who are eager to get hired so that's what we want to focus on to figure out the how to's uh, so one of my our five-year goal is to create a very robust video training resource library to showcase their ideas and what does a successful hiring in a particular workplace environment look like? For example, for example, why not libraries across America actually would just openly say, hey, we're hiring autistic adults. It's a perfect environment for autistic people because the types of tasks required are very systematic. It's a quiet environment. And um, many autistic adults, they really enjoy doing freelancing. So they don't necessarily need to work at a place full time. Uh, we don't need to work in a workplace in uh, like an office space. There are so many opportunities in our um, community to be able to uh, do either a home-based business or uh, work part-time at the library or doing like freelancing. For example, I know of a place in Chicago, what they do is every weekend, um, they, uh, a couple of the autistic adults, they pick up uh, paper from, or documents from offices and every weekend they do that. So it's a sub monthly subscription um, model that they have created with all the offices in that their downtown and every weekend that's what they do. Um, so there's so many ideas and we really want to show on our online platform all these wonderful ideas and really help connect uh, our community and all these ideas so we can empower each other. Um, I really believe that the only way for us to increase the neurodivergent hiring overall is by showing businesses of all sizes to be able to take on the hiring process all in-house. So you can continue to hire an autistic person, um, not just um, hiring them, but also know how to do the onboarding and also know how to support them, how to problem solve, and how to make that person really become part of your uh, work culture. Uh, so that's really, really important. Okay. So the career assessment tool that I created is called Capable. And it's actually a short for career assessment protocol for abilities beyond labels. So the capable tool is designed with input from neurodivergent individuals, which is which is very, very important for me because I think the big problem we have today in not just in empl for employability, pr employability pur purposes, but also as far as early intervention, you know, educational goals and, you know, transitional programs there, they were created by neurotypical people. And well-intentioned people, of course, but that's why it hasn't worked really, really well to support uh, neurodivergent indi individuals. Um, so it was very important for me to put the pieces together with the input of autistic people. Uh, and that's what I did. Every single activity had uh, input. And in fact, one of the autistic adults told me we need to just create a, a color coded scoring form because then it's simpler for us. We can memorize it. We understand exactly what areas of needs we need to work on. Okay. Um, um, so the unique uh, outcome of the capable tool is an, a caption, edited and captioned short video resume along with 
along with uh, uh, the video and along with um, a, a summary. The, 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 it's basically a portfolio of the video and the written summary that a job seeker can present to uh, uh, a possible uh, supervisor or you know, somebody hiring in the community. Um, and also I created this tool to really help the support system for each young adult. So for family members to continue to work on the areas of needs for the autistic job seeker to understand exactly what they need to continue to work on, but also to continue to grow using their own strengths and their special interests. That's very, very important. And also for workplace mentors, if they know exactly how to guide um, their client, um, um, that would be ideal. Um, uh, and I hope that in the long run, capable tool uh, is going to replace the standard verbal interview that uh, autistic people, uh, in general, really have a hard time to pass because we don't know how to talk about our strength, we don't know how to embellish, and we don't really read the interviewee interviewers' um, communication very, very well. So, in general, a verbal interview is very, very hard for us to pass. Okay. Okay, the capable tool com components, uh, I have the assessment manual um, and uh, it's so the assessment itself, it's videotape and there's a scoring form to go with uh, each mod module and then it's edited to about five to seven minutes. Um, and I'm going to show you two case studies, two videos of two uh, job seekers and then um, the last part is career readiness summary and the coaching. So the coaching part, of course, is something that we would do, whether it's we do it through online classes or also hands-on training post-COVID. Hopefully, we will cross our fingers, get there later on this year. Um, the career resume captures uh, three different phases. So there are three modules. And, um, but each module really uh, look at these three different areas. Phase one is self-regulation. We want to show potential businesses how a job seeker can self-regulate and what is the preferred method to self-regulate. It's actually very, very simple. Uh, we allow job seekers to come in bringing whatever they want to be able to self-regulate. So some people you will see bring a slinky, other people just play on their phone to just get ready uh, for something important. Uh, they can just self-regulate in however they want. Uh, we give them access to self-regulation activities and they're allowed movement breaks during the interview process at any time. Um, and phase two, of course, is the heart of this, uh, this assessment. Uh, we want to look at their ability to uh, learn by doing, make decision, ongoing decisions, be able to problem solve, make choices, um, how they're able to understand instructions and in what way, and also can they reflect on what they've done. Um, and phase three, we want to understand um, their uh, preferred communication. So this is the part that I feel like really, really important that we need to immediately educate potential businesses or mentors that autistic communication is just as valid as neurotypical, neurotypical communication. And when you see um, I, uh, an edited video resume, I could easily caption to highlight the preferred communication method in a way that is not looking at it as a deficit model, but it's just a different model. So phase three, we want to look at how job seekers are able to co-create and mentor, report progress, and just in general share experiences and maybe share what their um, special interests are to uh, like a coworker, a, a different, a mentor at work. All right, so I'm gonna keep going here. 
Uh, so now we're looking at the assessment, assessment modules. Module one is designed for candidates needing minimal support levels. So this one, I'm able to put in more activities. And a one uh, of the activities can be uh, tailored specifically to a particular job position. So if you, let's say a business is like a bookstore, you can definitely um, design uh, one activity that would help you understand, can the person potentially work in a bookstore, right? Uh, so module one, um, it's designed for me, uh, for people who need medium to complex support level. So it's just shorter. Um, but we're looking at the same, the three phases that I described previously. And module three is the shortest one. So I created this one for like after COVID. <laughs> so this is the one that actually job seekers can do at home. It's still videotaped um, by them. And then the video clips are given to us. And then we do the same process. We edit it, we caption it, we score it and put it together with a, a, a res like a a, a summary of skills and aptitudes and interests and areas of needs. Uh, it's just done remotely by the job seekers or also with businesses, they can design, do this remotely on their own. Okay. All right. So the, when I created the manual, it's very, very important for me because this is how we're going to be able to teach businesses uh, and just scale up the capable tool. So I wrote up the manual to be very, very specific, I hope, and easy to understand. Um, so the goal is to provide a business owner or a career assessment guidelines on how to set up an optimal work environment for a neurodiverse job seeker. So in general, because of our sensory and processing difficulties, uh, we really need a quiet environment. For example, I talk about the autistic versus neurotypical communication differences. Uh, I also talked in detail about pacing um, and also uh, what would be the best way for um, to support a job seeker, like the, their preferences to be able to understand instructions might be different from one person to another. Some people do well with photos, some people do well with instructions, some, some people do well with uh, like just uh, uh, like very simple instructions in the booklet type. So, you know, it's, it just gives a really clear uh, ideas for businesses and mentors on how to best help this one job seeker. Uh, we also want uh, the guides to learn how to give clear and positive feedback without hovering over people and making job seekers nervous. Um, we also want uh, just to have an, an overview uh, for like for how to connect and explore interests uh, with an autistic adult. Um, and it, the last one is actually very important. Everyone has implicit and explicit biases, and a lot of times we don't realize. Uh, and we definitely need everyone at, in a work place to be able to understand and, and put it aside, right? All right. So, okay. So this is just a, a quick, uh, you guys can take a look at this quickly. Uh, how the assessment protocol in the manual looks like. It's very, very, it's very detailed. And this is a scoring for a sample that I talked earlier that is color coded, red meaning it's an area of need and yellow meaning it means that the person can actually do it, but probably need to do um, more or uh, just keep practicing. And of course, a green would be like, they have this down. They're really, really good at this. So as you can see, it's very, very simple for everyone. <laughs> I don't like to write reports. So this is a simple way that we can generate report for everyone and, and uh, um, be able to figure out uh, the next step, the on onboarding process. Okay, so the video portfolio goals, um, I think, let me see here. Uh, I think the goal is an important spotlight would be to, uh, oops, 
Nice is doing this. Okay. So it's an interesting question to explore if uh, a potential business would actually hire uh, an autistic job seeker if they can look at a video portfolio and a summary. So that's uh, a, an interesting research question that I'm very, very interested in. And also this one is important to explore potential roles within the company, job carving. Job carving is when you actually create a role that is not yet existing. This is, I love doing this because it means that you care about your uh, this uh, job seeker and you're creating something unique and you're able to think outside of the box as a business owner. Um, okay. Okay, so, uh, and the last one here is to be able, when you can see the video, you can see the person's personality, uh, you know, communication preferences, then you can actually think about possible mentors at your workplace that can be paired uh, to guide the autistic job uh, seeker um, at the beginning. So I think it's really helpful to be able to see uh, the person um, using a video format. Okay, so now we do the fun part. So this young man, Ryan, is a very, very talented musician. So the first video, Ryan, he's 20 years old. Uh, he's studying at San Jose State University and jazz music major. Uh, he wanted to be part of a band. He plays guitar. He's also a very talented uh, drummer. Uh, and he is actually, since the capable assessment, he is now working on teaching other autistic kids online to play percussion. So he's doing really, really well. And uh, I'm gonna show you first his case study. And then the second one is Alex. Alex is the proud owner of Big Al's Toffee. So for people who are from the Bay Area here, Peninsula, just all over the Bay Area. He's he's our superstar. He makes an award-winning um, toffee, and uh, he's also an artist. So he does beautiful calligraphy, and uh, he sells these cards um, uh, at gift shops all over our area. But now they moved to San Diego, so it's our loss. And he also he's also a great community volunteer. So since the capable assessment, we were able to figure out his areas of needs and I was able to guide his mentors. And of course, uh, Alex becoming more independent and enjoying his, his work more because he's, he was very, very proud to be able to make his own decisions at work. Um, so it has been really uh, an amazing journey for these two participants. All right, so I'm going to um, the show and I'm going to show you Ryan. So this is Ryan, our musician. Okay, so there will be music, you guys. So if you don't like music, just brace yourself. <laughs> okay, so everyone brings their chosen activity. And the feedback we got was that uh, just being able to start an interview process showing your potential like boss what you were really really good at that was a game changer changer so every single one of them uh gave that feedback so because ryan loved to create uh his his own music that's what we started with uh, as you could see the fidget box is there but he didn't really it wasn't his thing he didn't need it Remember, you'll have a chance later to continue. 
So very quickly, we saw that he was a perfectionist and he really had a hard time trans transitioning because he wanted to keep working on the details. And so that was an area that we worked on. And this activity is uh, marshmallow stick building, which uh, some of the companies in the Bay Area also use this to see how creative people are and how they design. Also found out that he was actually a great mentor. So he was uh, teaching Pete, uh, my so assistant during the assessment, year, how to play the, the song. Yeah, So this was phase three, where we just do like a conversation. Um, sometimes we look at like a, like a set of questions and choose the questions we want. There's really no right or wrong of doing it just to get to know each other. Um, and coffee. Um, um, so I'll fast forward. Okay. So this was phase three. So this was after the assessment and here was a clip of him teaching a student. I want you to see his face. He looks so happy and so proud. Ryan, and I started. You can already hold your drumsticks. Mm -hmm. You learn how to read music. Mm -hmm. You're doing some movements really quickly. Mm -hmm. You learn how to play with both hands and feet when on the drum kit. Mm -hmm. And you've already have a basic drum beat down. Mm. Okay. So that was a message that he uh, gave to his student before COVID. So he was able to just take on the whole process of guiding somebody because it was based on his special interests. And that's basically his home base. So I'm going to just quickly stop sharing so I can see all of you just making sure everything went well, <laughs> didn't have any glitches, right? Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to move on to uh alex's video now okay all right so alex did the second um hang on one second i just think that the sound was a bit low but as long as you guys could hear it that's fine okay so alex did the second module and Alex needed uh, more scaffolding, if you want to call it that. So this is a picture of his business, Big Al's Best. If you're in San Diego, you can order his toffee via his uh, Facebook group, Facebook page, uh, Big Al's Best. Only if you're in San Diego, though, because they cannot ship, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, so here is Alex. Now, Alex really, really needed the phase one, the self-regulation phase. He just needed to take his time. That's Pixie. So when you're ready, when you're finished playing with these, you can do this whenever you're ready. You can take your time, okay? Okay. Okay. We really took advantage of the fidget box. We don't get really give a... Uh, the candidates' instructions. It's very important that they go with the, their own flow. And we want to see how they transition, actually. 
Everybody loves the fidget box, but of course, after COVID, this this has to be redesigned because uh, it, it's we can't really share fidget toys anymore. <laughs> and the prepared activity Alex brought was putting together a set of his cards, his greeting cards. As you can see, he was very organized. He knew what to do. He is one of those guys who, once he knows what the job is all about, he's very focused and he wants to finish everything without a break. So I thought that that's, that's a very uh, admirable uh, ability to be able to do that because I struggle with that. Uh, okay. They have sensory breaks. Uh, Let's get ready. All right. Now this is uh, a book sorting activity. So, so for Alex, Alex, I just increased the scaffolding by. Uh, I just used sticky notes, and I printed out the instructions. And Alex did really there. well. And then this is what you're supposed to be doing. Okay, so. Go ahead and read it. Today, we would like you to help us sort through a box of old books and to donate to the library. Yeah. Please follow the, and follow the directions below. First, so I can, you, as you can see, if you're a business owner and you're looking at this video, you actually already understand a lot when it comes to the types of accommodations a business owner might think about, like a sensory break room and all these things and different ways that you might be able to support somebody like Alex, right? So he has never done that activity you before. Done? Oh, he did it really well. That was really fast. Really nice. Let's see. Let's check. Okay. Now watch Alex's face. Okay, that's pretty good. So the task was to just sort All right. into different categories. Okay. Was that easy? Yes. That was easy. I like your lipstick, Macy. Oh, thanks, Alex. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that. The yeah, new right. lipstick. You made me he gave me a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> I like your slinky. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so we're done with the books, and you didn't need help at all. That was super easy. So would you like to relax a little bit more? Okay, so this is an example of career training. So we have basically a work support plan, what we're gonna be working on. So from the assessment, we saw that Alex was very dependent on other people telling him what to do and how to do things. So we really work on decision making, the independent decision making. Okay. All right, so that is Alex. So I'm gonna hurry up and finish um, because we have two other presenters. Okay. Uh, so uh, our needs right now, what Autism Career Pathways need is really uh, an opportunity to partner up with parents who want to explore home-based businesses and really working on the building blocks to be able to think about that budget for it and working on a business plan and have their uh, autistic family member go through the capable tools and really partner up with us to make it happen. <laughs> That's what we need. We need partnerships with uh, families and also partnerships with small businesses to do this in, in order to create content for our online platform, the video training resources, we need to add content now. Um, yeah, so training to implement capable tools to re hopefully replace verbal interviews. Um, we, we're gonna provide consultation um, to businesses who wanna learn and also have, create their own way of customized screening, career screening tool, we can help them customize it. Uh, we will provide mentor training and also a customized uh, neurodiverse hiring and support process. So that's what we're trying to do right now. Um, 
So I think that is it. Uh, this is my information. My email, Macy at autismcurepathways.com. And that this is our website. And uh, I'm very proud of a YouTube channel, Autism Career Pathways, where I interview all kinds of um, uh, careers by autistic adults. So that's our YouTube channel and also my Instagram. It's actually, I changed that to at Autism Career Pathways. So it's not ASD, it's at Autism Career Pathways. So we post projects and interviews and ideas for um, autistic young adults there. Okay, so uh, my part is done. All right, so I think Matt, you're next. All right, so everyone, uh, my name is Matt. So I am an individual with autism and I'm just gonna go right into my presentation, but just, um, I just wanna say something really quick. So I'm not gonna pay attention to the chat right now. So if anyone does have any questions, um, we're gonna have a Q and A session later on at the end. So if you do have questions, just please save them until the end and then I'll answer any and all questions at that time. Thanks. So this is my journey. Uh, next slide, please. So being different. I always knew that something seemed off. It was just that as a child, I never understood exactly what that was. I always thought that it was others when in reality it was me. Next slide, please. motor skills or lack thereof. As a child, and even to this day, I have struggled tremendously with motor skills, tying my shoes, buttoning my pants, using a zipper, catching a ball, and spatial awareness among other motor-related skills were incredibly difficult. Through occupational therapy as a child and having grown older, my motor skills have improved, but I still require help when learning new motor tasks as they don't come naturally to me. Next slide, please social challenges. In addition to motor skills, I struggled socially. When I was in preschool, if another kid approached me wanting to play, I would just smile and run away. I would also engage in parallel play and imitate what others were doing without really interacting with them. When others made jokes, I would not understand them and take it very literally. Next slide, please. Eye contact, which leads me to an instant elementary school regarding eye contact. Another student accused me of staring at him, and I took it so literally that I avoided eye contact for the longest time, preferring to look down, fearful of being accused of staring at someone. Reading facial expressions. Speaking of eye contact, a related challenge was being able to read facial expressions. It was difficult for me to read others' emotions, and you can imagine the misunderstandings I have gotten into when someone looks sad, and I had no way of being able to acknowledge that. This can still be a challenge today, but I've gotten much better at it. Next slide, please. Sensory issues. I remember as a child, I had sensory issues that mostly revolved around the sensation of touch. We had to cut off the tags on the back of my shirts because to me, it felt like there was a needle digging into the back of my skin. Getting my clothing wet also caused me a great deal of discomfort. And even if I just got my sleeve a little bit wet, I would have to change out of that shirt. Now, the majority of these sensory issues no longer persist for me, but for many individuals with autism, sensory issues are a constant challenge. Next slide, please. Executive function and, and observance. So for many individuals, myself included, executive function is a challenge. So this would be transitioning from one task to another. Because we get so absorbed in tasks, it is often very difficult to change from one thing to another. Additionally, many individuals with autism have intense interests. As a child, I was very observant and would point out the most insignificant things, such as a light bulb missing in a classroom or how the cable wires on the drive home from school looked odd because they were kind of all tangled together and squished. Next slide, please. Routine. So while having a routine is generally a good thing, I took it to the extreme as a child. I remember being picked up from school by my mother and how I would be adamant about how we would have to always take the same exact route home every single day. There was even a time where we just had to go to McDonald's every school after, sorry, there was a time that we had to go to McDonald's every day after school, regardless of whether or not we actually purchased anything just because that was part of my routine. Next slide, please. Interests. So 
On the topic of taking things to the extreme, many individuals with autism have limited interests but are deeply into them. As a child, for some reason, I was really into trucks, particularly construction vehicles. I would make my grandmother stand with me in the street as I observed all the road construction. There was even a time when I was standing and I was just watching the construction vehicles that one of the workers offered me the opportunity to actually go into the backhoe with them. To this day, when I'm, in, when I'm interested in something, I usually go all out and into it and spend a lot of time with that particular interest. Next slide, please. Middle school. Middle school was a period of transition for me. So while I did well academically, I remember it being very difficult for me since it was the first time that I had multiple classes to go to. And as you know, because of executive functions issue, that was definitely a really big new difficult challenge for me. So my executive function challenges made this transition from one class to another very tough. And I had no idea why at the time. Furthermore, middle school was also a period of loneliness for me. I only had one person that I would really consider a friend and I never attended any of the after school functions such as the dances, not because I didn't want to, but because I was too anxious and I had no one to go with. Next slide, please. High school. High school is much of the same as middle school, except that I made more attempts to try and be more outgoing and social. I had a small group of friends here and there throughout high school, but it felt incredibly superficial. And it was more like I was just part, or I was just in the group rather than actually a part of the group. I did meet one person, however, that I did consider a friend in high school, but towards the end of high school, I became even more lonely because he graduated uh, two years before I graduated. So I ended up not deciding not to attend graduation because I didn't have anyone I'd really be able to celebrate with and take pictures with. Next slide, please. So what prompted the diagnosis? So when I was two years old, I received a very vague diagnosis of neurological disorder due to delayed motor development. I had difficulty in preschool and was given yet again another vague diagnosis when I was four or five years old. Because I struggled socially in elementary school, I was finally diagnosed with something a bit more defined, that being nonverbal learning disorder. But it wasn't until the beginning of high school, after my parents saw how much I struggled socially, that I finally was diagnosed as having Asperger's at the age of 16. So finally, in 2018, I received a diagnosis of autism to receive regional center services. Despite receiving the Asperger's diagnosis at 16, autism meant nothing to me at the time, and Asperger's was just a label to me. Next slide, please. College. So... The social challenges that I had throughout middle school and high school persisted in college. Like in high school, I made attempts at making friendships by joining clubs and trying to get involved in different activities. However, every attempt was met with failure and I again had that feeling of being in the group but not truly a part of the group. I remember college not being a particularly happy time for me but I just hoped to graduate as quickly as possible. I was also not receiving much support outside of my college's DSDS since I had lost contact with my psychiatrist while in college. So although I graduated from UC Berkeley, it was not without many struggles. I did extremely well academically at Berkeley, but it is dangerous to conflate academic success with success in general. Next slide, please. Living independently. And so notice how I put independently in quotes. And the reason I do so is because even though I was living alone, I was not truly living independently. Both during my college and my first job in Vegas, I lived alone but struggled immensely. Cleaning, cooking, and even something as simple as taking out the trash were arduous tasks. Ultimately, cleaning rarely was done and I tended to take out food and almost never cooked. I think that was a sense of being overwhelmed by so many tasks, which goes back to my executive function challenges that made all of this so difficult. I also believe that my deteriorating mental state, both in college and on my first job, made simple tasks such as taking the trash out so difficult. Next slide, please. My first job. So initially I was very excited for my first job at Aria in Las Vegas, but that excitement quickly fell apart. I was completely overwhelmed by the lack of structure in my first job, having to live independently and feeling drained every day returning home from work. Furthermore, the work environment was incredibly social I also did not receive any support nor accommodations even after letting my manager know that I have autism. Not because they didn't care, but they simply did not have the knowledge, resources, or expertise to work with individuals who have autism. 
As an introvert, the social interactions made me feel incredibly anxious. The lack of direction and structure also caused me a lot of frustration and concern as I was often unsure of what to do. It eventually got to the point in which I was so overwhelmed and depressed that I called home every night crying and complaining about how depressed I was. Next slide, please. Quitting. After only three or four months, I quit the job in disgrace. It was the lowest point of my life. I felt as if I had stayed as long as I could, but my, my mental state had deteriorated so much and I knew that I needed professional help. I didn't want to quit the job because I felt like I was letting everyone down, particularly my parents, but I reached the point knowing that if I stayed any longer, I wouldn't be doing any favor for my mental health. It was a rocky few months after that. Next slide, please. Mental health. The recovery period was challenging. I remember being so de depressed and disappointed that everything felt hopeless. A good analogy to represent my state of mind at the time was that each morning I would wake up with a huge boulder on top of me and metaphorically it felt impossible to will myself out of bed. Fortunately, I ended up seeking therapy and my mental state gradually improved. Next slide, please. Mind Institute. So I eventually attended a program at the UC Davis Mind Institute called the Access Program, which ended up changing my life. It was there that we learned about techniques to help us cope with challenges as well as practice social situations. The most notable thing about the Access Program was that the staff wanted those of us who were not working at the time to volunteer, which is something I ended up doing with an organization called Library. Next slide, please. Library. So Library is an ad autism advocacy organization that provides free events to individuals with autism. I ended up teaching a public speaking class and offering life coaching services to the other young adults there. Volunteering with Fly Brave changed my life. It was with Fly Brave that I built the self-confidence and self-esteem that I lacked throughout my entire life. I learned that I could speak to large audiences of people when not long ago, it was a struggle to communicate with even just a single other individual. It was with my work in Fly Brave healing others that allowed me to heal myself rejuvenating my mental state. From there, I decided that I wanted to dedicate my life to helping other individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities. Next slide, please. So Maristem. So I worked up in Ulta, um, the regional center Ulta vendor called DDSO. And one of the employees there suggested that I reach out to Maristem. I ended up doing so and have been employed with Maristem for, actually now it's more than a year. It's close to a year and a half now. So. Maristem is a three-year transitional program for young adults with autism and other developmental disabilities between the ages of 18 and 28. Maristem prepares students to live independently and in work into the workforce, attend college, and have fulfilling lives. Next slide, please. We're working at Maristem. So at Maristem, I work as a work skills instructor, job coach, and teach a variety of classes, including but not limited to limited to communication and life coaching to help prepare our students for life after they graduate. I'm also a TAP or Transformative Autism Program trainer and I've helped develop training modules that we've used to teach California employers best practices to hire, retain, and work with individuals with autism. Next slide, please. So the difference. I believe that there are a variety of reasons for my success while working at Maristem versus my unsuccessful experience at ARIA. First and foremost, at Maristem, we are doing work that is meaningful and rewarding to me. Both teaching our students and watching them develop as well as my work teaching the TAP material to employees has been very uh, fulfilling work to me. In contrast, the work that I did at ARIA did not have that same sense of work and fulfillment. Next slide, please. Difference continued. Having sought therapy, attending the Mind Institute's access program and volunteering at Fly Brave, I'm in a very different place in my life than I once was when I worked at ARIA. Throughout my life, I've always had a very low self-esteem, but these experiences have all made me respect and recognize my own self-worth. My improved self-esteem has also led to a dramatic increase in my self-confidence to do whatever it is that I hope to achieve in my life. At ARIA, I lack the ability to believe in myself and my abilities, which led to my failure. Next slide, please. Growth. I feel that I've grown tremendously in the short amount of time that I have been with Maristem. 
I've learned so much both professionally and individually and I'm incredibly thankful for all the experiences that I've had at Maristem. Maristem helps our students grow through our, through our instruction, but it's through my work providing support to our students and working with California employers for TAP that I have actually grown myself as well. It was also through my interaction with both coworkers and our students that I have developed in the area that I have long lacked in socially. I now co-teach a social skills class based on the development of a program in UCLA for young adults with autism called Pierce. Next slide, please. So fill in the chasm. So thankfully, autism is now recognized as a developmental disability that impacts millions of people. There are plentiful resources out there dedicated to children with autism, but when people age out of the system, resources disappear. I wanna help fill that chasm with a particular emphasis on employability and trying to help work with and convince employers to hire qualified adults with autism. Thank you. Oh, and then one more thing. Yeah, so my contact, I, just, I did add my contact here. So if anyone does want to contact me about anything, that is my email. That's mattgarethhormitz at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone. Sorry, I messed it up a bit there. It's just really jumping. Awesome job, Matt. Thank you. Oh, yay, Matt. Very good. Awesome. You go, I go, you go, I go. We have to, Patrick is up next. Patrick is next. All right. So, should I just share my um, recording here or? Yeah. All That's right, fine. let's let's do that, and let's get the random Icelandic volcano out of the way there. Sorry, I was just, you know, keeping an eye on the Icelandic volcano. All right, so I have um, the great pleasure of introducing myself as of a week ago. Um, so without further ado, uh, here is myself from a week ago, except that I don't think I um, shared audio. Sorry, let's try that again. Um, right. Hello. So to introduce myself quickly, I am Patrick DeWire, and I am an autistic autism researcher. Uh, I am both uh, a PhD candidate at UC Davis doing autism research, especially around sensory processing, but also various other topics. Um, and I'm also autistic myself. So I have um, some you know, personal lived experience. I'm part of the autistic community. Um, and I'm here to talk um, about autism employment and specifically some common myths around that um, so that we can uh, rebut these myths. Uh, hopefully we're already uh, on the same page about this particular myth that autistic people are bad workers or else why would we be here? But I figure it doesn't hurt to start out um, with the basics uh, because you might think, well, autistic people are very often unemployed. There's you know, high levels of um, insecure employment um, or underemployment, people employed below their skill levels. So surely this must be because autistic people um, are bad workers. Um, there's one really disturbing um, longitudinal study that showed uh, that when uh, you follow a group of autistic people across multiple time points in adulthood, uh, only a quarter of them are consistently engaged in employment and post-secondary education. Um, a lot of people are you know, very spotily engaged. Um, they you know, have this pattern of insecure or temporary employment. Um, and a third of the people never had a job, never attended post-secondary education at any time, which is really, really shocking. So why is this? Um, well. It might actually not be something that has to do with the autistic people so much um, as the society that we live in. Uh, there's a wonderful study by Noah Sassen and others, and there's other similar studies uh, out there um, where uh, the uh, experimenters uh, recorded autistic um, people um, with you know, normal range IQs, verbally fluent, um, as well as uh, typically developing individuals. And then they took um, uh, these recordings um, and they uh, showed static um, still images from them, um, silent um, video clips, um, audio recordings with no video, um, and combined uh, audio visual clips as well as transcripts of the speech content 
um, to another group of neurotypical individuals um, who are asked to rate um, these stimuli. And uh, what you can see here is uh, that the autistic people were rated much more negatively on everything except what they actually said. In terms of the transcript of what was actually said, there were no group differences. There was something subtle about the style, the presentation um, that was driving these negative judgments. So it's not that necessarily autistic people lack the skills. It might be, you know, bias on our part. Um, there's also, you know, other issues of accessibility, um, you know, the sensory domain, uh, which as I, I said earlier, I study myself is, you know, really uh, important here. Uh, a lot of autistic people uh, are very prone to sensory distraction. If there's, you know, even some a relatively mild stimulus in the background, like a flickering light um, or, you know, the sound of the air conditioning or something that can really make it difficult to focus. Um, there's sensory frustrations and aggravations um, sometimes as well, you know, uh, which are kind of similar, except that the stimuli they're capturing attention are really, really annoying. Um, but perhaps most seriously of all, you've got sensory distress. Um, there's just so much um, noise, um, so much stimulation that it becomes overwhelming, um, then we can undergo sensory overload, which is really hard to describe. The English language doesn't have the terminology, but it becomes impossible to think and, and function. It, it just becomes completely overwhelming. Um, and some people even report in addition to that experiencing pain, like pain in response to loud noises, pain hyperacusis, which uh, I don't personally experience, but I can only imagine it must make everything considerably worse. Um, so that the, the need then I would say would be not just to focus on like teaching job skills to autistic people, because I think it's a myth that we are bad workers, but to work with employers as well to create accessible and welcoming um, in employment environments. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the interventions that have been looked at in terms of promoting autism employment have tended to be focused on the autistic person based on this myth of the autistic person being a bad worker. But if you look at the outcomes of studies that include the employer, um, you can see incredible success uh, attained by autistic people in employment. So uh, this wonderful group of researchers in Virginia um, in, in one study, we're able to place 98% of all their participants um, in, you know, competitive integrated employment positions uh, by working with the employer as well as the individual through a job coaching model um, where, you know, both um, the um, autistic person, you know, gets the support that they need to figure out um, the expectations of the workplace environment and also the employer gets support in, you know, making sure that that environment is accessible. Uh, and, you know, other work coming out of that same uh, group um, includes a randomized control trial um, where, you know, a, a, an intervention that placed autistic people in internships during their final year of high school um, was 87% successful in these individuals um, retaining employment um, somewhere not necessarily in that same internship uh, a year later um, compared to just 12% in the control group, which is probably the largest effect size that I've ever seen in, in any autism intervention study. Uh, in contrast, uh, if you look at intervention studies that are focusing just on the individual, you see much poorer outcomes uh, in terms of actually attaining employment. And many of the studies don't even bother to report whether their participants had jobs, which is somewhat so clearly we, you know, a lot of the barriers here are, are nothing to do with autistic people being bad workers, but with employment environments um, not being set up for autistic people, which is where things like uh, what Maisie was talking about earlier, you know, these um, tools that could be used to help people um, evaluate um, prospective autistic employees without these biases influencing their judgment, that's where those could have a really profound impact. Um, because autistic people do have a lot of strengths to offer. Um, one of the core things about autistic people is we tend to have this 
hyper-focus, this wonderful attention to detail. If we're intrinsically interested in our work, we can get very easily into flow states in which we can be you know, incredibly productive. Um, uh, we also have other strengths as well. I think we're, you know, very conscientious usually. Um, we, you know, just uh, behave with integrity. We want to respect proper procedures and ways of doing things. Um, we're honest. Um, we also, I think, you know, can often offer a different perspective, some original ideas, and we do tend, I think, to resist um, groupthink and conformity. So many, many general strengths of autistic people. But there is a myth around that autistic people, um, even if they're not bad workers, are you know, only good at repetitive tasks or in STEM fields. Um, that's the stereotype that we're um, all, you know, either these STEM geniuses um, or that we're really great at repetitive tasks. And this is often related to another myth that autism is this single dimensional spectrum of severity from mild to severe. That is, of course, not the case. Autism is incredibly diverse on, you know, every possible dimension that you could imagine. Um, so we often now think of autism not as a spectrum, but as a constellation. Um, and, and, you know, a constellation um, is at least three dimensional. You could also imagine other dimensions there in some kind of fancy and dimensional space. Um, to represent the true variability of humans. Um, and what that means is that individual autistic people will have a huge variety of strengths. Yes, there are some autistic people who are brilliant, um, you know, in repetitive tasks, who are brilliant, you know, in STEM fields. We've also got autistic people who have a wonderful ability to work with and have empathy for animals who um, have, you know, tremendous strengths in terms of literature, um, you know, music and other forms of art, uh, cooking. Uh, we know about the music from one of Maisie's case studies, right? Analysis, synthesis and integrating information, systemizing, there's so many um, strengths, like tremendous human diversity. Um, another strength though, uh, sorry, another myth, excuse me, that you might commonly hear about autism is the myth that autistic people just don't want to interact socially with coworkers. And that is not true, obviously, or we wouldn't be calling it a myth. Uh, in reality, there's, you know, incredibly um, uh, high rates of loneliness um, among autistic people that are impactful in terms of mental health. Autistic people do experience tons of distress in, you know, uh, relation to social exclusion uh, as much as neurotypicals um, and we're a lot more likely, unfortunately, to be socially excluded. Uh, in fact, autistic people will go to tremendous lengths in order to try and uh, make it so that we can be socially included. Um, so research has been done showing that uh, autistic people often, um, you know, go to tremendous effort to hide our autism to appear more neurotypical in order to fit in. Uh, autistic women um, especially um, do this, but of course, um, all autistic people do this to some extent. Uh, and this is difficult. It requires, you know, a great deal of effort. It's exhausting. It requires, you know, sort of denying one's own identity uh, as well. And so it's not perhaps particularly surprising that it's associated with all kinds of negative outcomes in terms of uh, mental health, uh, even, you know, suicidality. And it's related to something we call autistic burnout, um, where, the accumulated stress that we're experiencing because of having to cope with all of these additional demands that don't affect neurotypical people, like the need to constantly camouflage and hide who we are, the need to cope with our sensory overloads and avoid sensory distraction and all of these things that consume so much energy on a day-to-day -day basis um, end up exhausting us to the point that we start to lose skills and abilities that our sensory challenges get more um, and more uh, problematic, which 
can just create these downward spirals. Um, but this is, of course, not inevitable. Um, uh, understanding and acceptance, reducing the pressure on people to camouflage, um, these can promote recovery. Uh, if people show you know, empathy for autism, that can promote recovery from autistic burnout, um, or better yet, prevent autistic burnout from, experience, from being experienced in the first place. So in terms of social interaction, I you know, would urge everyone to um, be friendly, but also flexible. We're always talking about how uh, autistic people are inflexible, yet from my point of view as an autistic person, I would argue that it's usually neurotypical people who are inflexible. Um, we need to, of course, accept autistic people as they are, not put on pressure to people to camouflage or pretend to be somebody else, um, to be you know, open and willing to include autistic people socially, but also not to force autistic people into social interaction to the point that it becomes exhausting and stressful. Um, and be open to innovative ideas in order to make it easier for people to participate in social interactions. Uh, so for example, uh, at autism conferences, we often use uh, social interaction preference systems where people uh, wear you know, a badge or something to indicate whether they want to be approached for social interaction or not. So for example, you can see here categories like um, I would like to contribute to social interaction, but I may find it hard to initiate. So if you see me wearing this, um, please, you know, approach me. Um, I would love to be included in things. Um, versus down here, you know, I'm a bit overwhelmed right now. Please don't initiate any interaction with me. I just want to be left alone um, currently. And, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be colors that are used to signal these because there could be you know, issues of accessibility around color blindness, but the point is just that there's so many simple things we can do that could honestly make life easier for, for everyone if they're adopted by everyone in, you know, an organization uh, or department, not just the autistic employee. There is in fact a myth that autistic people are bad communicators, um, but I would argue that that's not the case at all. Uh, and there's empirical evidence here to back me up. Um, so uh, there's this wonderful um, study um, where the researchers basically played the telephone game with their participants. Um, so, you know, telephone, of course, is where somebody uh, has a message that they then say to uh, somebody else whispering in their ear or something, who then passes it on to somebody else and so on until um, a highly garbled version of the message emerges at the end of the chain. And these researchers thought they would do that with autistic people and see what happened. And so they have three groups here. Um, the autistic people uh, are in green, uh, the non-autistic people are in red, and then mixed groups that include both autistic and non-autistic people are in blue. And what you can see is that there's a very steep loss of information um, in the mixed groups. People are very quickly, you know, uh, losing information in the message, uh, whereas actually the autistic groups are showing a very high retention of information, are showing great communication, um, uh, at least as good as the non-autistic groups. So autistic people seem to actually be great at communicating, it's just that neurotypical people and autistic people don't always experience success at communicating when they're trying to communicate with one another. And so what is it then about autistic people that makes us such great communicators with each other, but not neurotypicals? Well, I think that a lot of it comes down to the way that we just um, make our you know, communication interactions um, have the built-in capacity um, to cope um, with um, you know, differences in individuality because autistic people are not all alike. Uh, we're probably more diverse um, uh, than neurotypical people. Um, and so we expect that and we're prepared to cope with that. Um, it's been shown that our conversations are characterized by a low demand for coordination. Uh, people are sort of anticipating there might be miscommunication and ready to deal with it if it occurs to either move on or clarify depending on whether it's important or not. Um, 
that we have a high tolerance for you know conversation that goes off in you know unexpected directions based on our idiosyncratic interests. Um, our conversation uh, doesn't have to be as as constrained, and if it does run into an issue, we're prepared to deal with it. Um, Jim Sinclair said something that as so true based on my own experience that uh, when you get a group of autistic people together, um, we're not all going to be similar, um, but we're all ready to accept uh, everyone else for who they are. So my advice to you about this, uh, about how we can communicate effectively would be to uh, be clear, to um, speak you know, directly and concretely without um, idiom. Um, uh to adopt you know a nice gentle pace right now i'm going a little bit quickly um but this is a case where you can do as i say not do as i do because you know i'm under time constraints i have a talk here and i have a lot of things to say um and don't assume that people understand you know check in make sure that people are understanding what you're saying um you know, sometimes people will not understand, but also will be anxious about saying things. Um, flexibility, uh, especially in this virtual world, a lot of autistic people have you know, preferences about how we regulate the amount of social information that's being that we're being bombarded with. Because in a, you know social interaction, you've got so much nonverbal information constantly arriving, so many different signals. You know, I have random hand gestures, there's different um, facial expressions, you know, body language, uh, there I move my whole body in different ways. Um, and so that can be really overwhelming. And so uh, some people um, try and reduce the amount of information um, that they're getting. Um, other people try and increase as much as they can to try and avoid, you know, over-reliance on specific input. So some people might really like um, the telephone um, because it reduces that overload, whereas I really, really hate the telephone because I want as much information as I can to make sure I'm not missing something. Um, don't patronize people, of course. Um, you know, often if I disclose the fact that I'm autistic, uh, I notice that people do um, treat me a bit differently, but, you know, I'm uh, a PhD candidate. I'm, you know, fairly um, successful um, for somebody of my age, and uh, I don't want to be infantilized, nor do I think most other autistic people. So, you know, treat people as you would a neurotypical in their position. And, you know, ask the individual um, if they have advice, if there's things that they could be doing better to improve, uh, sorry, that you could be doing better to improve the communication. Um, uh, you know, everybody has individual needs, and they may be, you know, a much better uh, a guide as to what their individual needs are than you know I would be um, uh, when I'm speaking generally. Uh, and of course, you know, if you're talking about autism directly um, with people, you want to make sure that uh, any autism-related language that you use is um, you know correct and sensitive. Um, obviously, you know, with any identity, there's a lot of um, concern you know around what's appropriate terminology to use, and you don't want to use um, uh, terminology that is you know, demeaning or, or insulting. Finally, um, I, I thought um, it's important to confront the myth that autistic people lack empathy, which is unfortunately something that has been commonly said by uh, researchers and that is uh, really not true, um, at, at least not 100% um, not true. Um, because there's different kinds of empathy. Um, we can distinguish between this sort of cognitive empathy, what we might call theory of mind, this ability to understand and represent another person's mental states and feelings to understand you know, what it is that they're thinking, versus caring, versus having affective or emotional empathy, sympathy for another person. Only one of these seems to be, you know, affected in autism. It's true that autistic people can sometimes have difficulty interpreting and understanding other people's mental states, but that doesn't mean a lack of caring. Um, there's research that's been done to dissociate the cognitive and emotional aspects of empathy and 
while it's true that autistic people might not always know cognitively what's going on in another person's brain, which might make it difficult to offer appropriate sympathy, um, also, you know, might be difficult to do to know like what's the socially acceptable way of offering it in a particular moment if you don't um, have the same you know social fluency as a neurotypical person but the emotional empathy is intact in autism there's even some people who think that it's heightened that it's increased in a lot of autistic people so autistic people care um, and um, in fact uh, it's been pointed out that autistic people um, are often misunderstood by neurotypicals. Um, sure, you know, autistic people might sometimes have some difficulties with cognitive empathy, at least some autistic people, if not all, um, but neurotypical people might have great difficulty understanding the autistic point of view. This is something that we call the double empathy problem, and, you know, it requires active effort to try and understand a perspective that is unfamiliar and different from that of uh, other neurotypicals, um, which, you know, of course, is the perspective that neurotypical people are used to thinking about. So to summarize then, um, we have successfully, I think, um, bashed a number of myths, or at least um, uh, I have bashed them. Hopefully you found that convincing. Um, autistic people have, you know, many, many strengths here. Um, uh, autistic people, you know, could be great workers. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, unfortunately can face discrimination um, based not on substance of our abilities, but on subtle stylistic things. Um, we are socially motivated, though. Um, it's just that we can face um, burnout um, if we're forced to exhaust ourselves trying to appear neurotypical. Um, and we can, you know, socially present in unusual ways. Um, we can, however, communicate well. Uh, we just need neurotypical people to adjust their own communication styles um, to work better with our own. Um, and we do have plenty of empathy. Um, and unfortunately, it's often the case that our point of view is the one that is, is not being understood by other people. And we are an incredibly diverse population. You know, we all have unique strengths and challenges. So uh, it's important to avoid stereotyping autistic people as though uh, we're all STEM geniuses or whatever, but to um, understand and recognize people for who they are, uh, to communicate openly about, you know, their uh, own uh, unique um, strengths as well as what challenges and needs they might have, uh, you know, many of which can be easily met with um, very, very simple accommodations that don't require a great deal of effort. So thank you so much for your interest in this topic. Um, I really hope that we can, you know, work to, um, you know, overcome some of these uh, challenges, structural problems, biases that are restricting autistic people from thriving in employment and adulthood, um, and, you know, do so in a way that is mutually beneficial both for employers and for autistic people. Uh, thank you very much. Great very job, nice, Patrick. Patrick. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, really appreciate the positive feedback. And it uh, looks like we uh, still have plenty of time for questions and answers, right, Vanessa? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any questions for any of the speakers? You enjoyed it, didn't you? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, thanks, any... John. If you guys I... have any, yeah, there you go. I have um, a question too. Yeah, I'd rather talk than type. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Just pop on. Just okay. Pop on. It's, it's easier for me and faster. I'm a slow typist. Um, Maisie, the question for you, mm -hmm. um, you said you were interested in video content. Um, yes. Where are you and how far will you travel? <laughs> That's a good question. So um, if you're talking about, so the video content will be 
from two sources, right? Uh, it's it, well the the capable career uh, assessment that video content is just for the job seeker and um, his or her uh, family to access and use when they apply for a job. The video content that I'm talking for the online platform, that will come from partnerships from businesses. So I think some of it, uh, businesses can videotape themselves uh, coaching with uh, like my coach, I can coach online as much as possible. And then um, uh, people can videotape themselves practicing and mentoring at work and videotape it. As much as people feel comfortable, we can also collect um, just video clips of mentors at work or job seekers, uh, new new um, autistic uh, job candidate just doing like internships and just there are different ways to do it. I love to do the hands-on training. That's actually what I enjoy the most to be on side. <laughs> so if whenever there's an opportunity to do, to do that, I, I'm willing to come for a visit uh, and, and actually run the classes and do actually the hands-on training. Um, yeah, so I, where are you located? <laughs> In uh, Los Angeles, North Hollywood. Oh yeah, Los Angeles. The, I used to live in Los Angeles, so I try to go to LA any, any chance I can. So oh, okay. in fact, we're going in May. <laughs> so we definitely have to talk. Send me an email and then, you know, we'll work I, I out. will. Thank yeah, you very much. Absolutely. Yeah. So any other questions? Uh, somebody was asking about the recording. So if people need the recording, just email Vanessa or me, I suppose, and then we can give you access mm -hmm. to view the recording. Um, right. Yeah. Yep. There's somebody here asking about uh, costs. Um, I, I assume that's for you, Maisie. Oh, gosh. Uh, I have been just volunteering my time uh, because we are a nonprofit. Uh, we, you know, um, the way we work is through grants. We did apply for a grant. So, um, you know, I ask people to donate to Autism Care Pathway so I can continue to hire other autistic leaders to be able to put together resources. That's really important to me. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, just talk to me on the side and, you know, I, w I love to do like group trainings and I have written like a complete uh, proposal for um, just to do a presentation for parents and to do the capable assessments and then actually um, do the hands-on part with uh, businesses who are willing to do onboarding for these small group of uh, job seekers. So I was gonna do that with, I think Holiday Inn, um, but it got canceled because of COVID. So I'm doing every, so if you guys are interested, you know, send me an email and I'm definitely interested to, to go back out there and do the hands-on part and do this in person. So I'm seeing here a question on thoughts about um, employers training neurotypical em uh, employees about, about autism. And mm -hmm. I can say um, actually that some of my uh, collaborators, um, Project REACH, um, which is uh, at um, a City University in New York, um, Dr. Kristen Gillespie Lynch, um, they have done some, you know, really uh, fascinating research showing not in terms of training neurotypical employees, but uh, training neurotypical uh, peers in a college environment. So, so kind of similar. Um, that if you have the training designed by autistic people, it is actually much more effective in terms of reducing autism stigma and increasing autism knowledge compared to if the training is designed by neurotypical people. So, I think yeah, it's a great idea to train neurotypical employees, um, as long as it's autistic people um, who are somehow involved in developing the training in a meaningful way, I think that really improves the quality.
quality of these um, trainings. Uh, of course, it can get complicated, you know, if there's a case of an autistic employee who doesn't want to disclose their autism, but even in, in such a case, uh, I'm sure it would still be helpful for the neurotypical employees to have some general knowledge of autism, not specifically, you know, in relation to any individual. Uh, let me see. I could answer that question too. So Boston employees train their neurotypical. Yeah. So, as I mentioned before, uh, I've been we've done the transformative autism program training, and actually in that training, we say how for all the employers that we've been training that it's actually essential that um, the employers train all of their neurotypical employees on ASD. So there are actually mm -hmm. five phases. Um, for TAP and in the preparation phase, which is the first phase, we say like that's basically one of the first things that you want to do. So if you're creating an autism hiring program for your organization, it's imperative that everyone's on the same page and everyone kind of knows exactly what's going on, whether that's, you know, someone from, you know, whether it's the CEO or, you know, someone who's, you know, at the bottom, whatever. It's very important that everyone is on board and understands what's going on. So um, there's, there's a lot more that goes into it, obviously, than just educating them. Um, like in terms of like, we talk about how you have to also prepare um, the workplace environment. Like some things that we also suggest are things such as, you know, having, um, as I mentioned before, or as we've all mentioned before that, you know, many individuals with autism, we have uh, sensory issues. So having a, um, an area really where we can kind of cool down and kind of relax if, you know, if we get stressed out, that's really important. Um, so I know I'm going, I'm answering a little bit beyond the question, but basically, yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely imperative that employers train their employees on ASD. Yeah. I, and I just also want to add that I think every business or company should have a framework developed by autistic people when it comes to just the best way to like screen, um, uh, skills, uh, but also how to get to know the person. I get messages all the time through uh, the Autism Career Pathways social media, uh, the Instagram account. Just today, somebody was saying, well, I'm so afraid to make a mistake. Like, I just don't, I just do like what I was told, but I just don't say anything more than that, including my ideas, because I'm afraid to get fired. You know, there's that fear, like constantly, and it just breaks my heart. Um, it, it's not just opening your door, but also really uh, looking at yourself in terms of your full inclusion culture, you know, um, hiring an autistic person and give them giving them a space, you know, just because you think that's what they prefer, <laughs> like a corner, you know, that's not full inclusion culture. You know, so I think um, having an open um, mind and just really wanting to learn both sides, because I think autistic people, uh, we learn. I mean, we, we, we do our best to all through trials and errors. And um, I think self-disclosure process is very important if you want to open your doors to internships or hiring autistic people to just be able to figure out what's important to you and also what's important for us so it's a win-win culture here and um, I think everybody can do it can you imagine if there are mentors at the company who can really think outside of the box and know how to use their personal strength and traits to guide uh, neurodivergent people, that is going to be uh, a really fantastic company. <laughs> you're, you're teaching people to be leaders. I, I think it's, it's a dream come true, you know, and um, it's, that's, that's what Autism Career Pathways want to do is to figure it out. And um, I think hands-on of like just being there to support and modeling that interaction I, I love doing that because it's really hard to just read a manual and, you know, but at the end of the day, it's like when you are sitting next to an autistic colleagues, what are you going to do to connect and, you know, get to know each other? You know, it goes both ways. <laughs> That's right, Brandon. 
There was a question a little while ago from Gabby that we, I think, forgot about because I skipped over it to the next okay. question, but that was asking uh, Maisie if you've had um, success finding business partners um, uh, have, you know, who, who are interested in, in the videos. Has it led to any successful hiring? Not yet, because we started in 2019 and we got a grant to host Autism Goes to Work, a career expo here in Redwood City. And we had autistic people coming from all over the world to showcase their talents, like uh, business owners and musicians, a comedian, artists. But of course, we couldn't do it. That was going to be our platform <laughs> to get engaged with small businesses. But it's OK. Now I have Vanessa and fly brave so we're gonna just bring the party that side yeah <laughs> yeah maybe next year we'll do it again and uh, i mean i find that uh, in general it's very hard to engage with the business community also because the stigma is like so high you know so i wanted to really um host this event where it's really about median greed and, and ask us questions and, you know, uh, instead of just walking around collecting brochures. So I think in the future with these kind of events and also um, when I can really partner up with like business, like foundations like Vanessa's, uh, we could do it. We can create the videos. We can show the videos to small businesses. Would they be willing? to give it a try. Uh, I came from years of doing video modeling in my parent coaching at the clinic. That's what we do is we do video modeling. It's really tremendous because when you are with another person, you can't see yourself. But of course, with consent both ways that uh, we're videotaping each other to learn about our engagement, it's really tremendous. You know, you can change your mindset that way. And I really want to create career readiness curriculum where it's, it's not based on pathology and deficit model because autistic people have the skills. We do have the skills. That's not the issue. We need opportunities. We need support to be able to um, uh, not just use the skills and uh, the job, but really contribute. So. I don't know if I answered that question, but well, I can answer the question for my side as well. So thinking in terms of our video modules at Maristem. So we've actually, I believe we've had at least one actual hire from the video modules that we've done. And we've worked with, I don't remember exactly how many employers, at least 24 employers across California, but we've also worked with quite a few employers nationwide as well. And even though like maybe we, we haven't necessarily had as many um, successful hires as we would have hoped, we've definitely gotten a lot of great reception from the video modules. Like it's, it's like what we've learned is that, you know, there are many employers out there who are um, very interested in, you know, just learning how to hire and work with individuals who watch them. Uh, Blue Shield in particular, shout out to them because we've, we've done a lot of work with them. We actually had a Call with Blue Shield and Blue Shield is a large organization. They're very interested in um, opening their doors um, to individuals with autism. And we were actually on a call with about, you know, they're, they're basically their whole um, hiring team. Like there were like 60 plus Blue Shield employees on that call. So there's definitely employers out there who are interested. I think it's just that, you know, I think as we move on in the future, just like these upcoming years, I think it's really going to start the paradigms and start shifting Towards where people are really going to just um, opening open their arms to individuals with autism. So I think you know we're going in the right direction, even even if it might be a little bit slow right now. Yeah. Uh, so Celine, I actually was invited to do a presentation at Chamber of Commerce offices. I think it varies from city to city. Uh, some Chamber of Commerce, unless you pay as a member, then it's really hard to sneak into that. Uh, so I think, I think overall what Matt was saying also, like all these efforts to um, educate, uh, but 
I think overall the database for willing businesses, um, it's really, really still minimal. So that's why I was thinking really building a robust video library to show people the how to's. I think that's how we can slowly make a difference. Uh, if we can help people see and like spark ideas that way. So we'll see. <laughs> Any other questions? There was a question earlier um, asking about whether you're working maybe with the Department of Rehabilitation. Yes, I saw that. Yes, I I have been. They know about our nonprofit. Uh, again, it, it's now that we're approaching post COVID. Uh, I can I have connected to all of the local nonprofits, of course, but uh, it's 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 not as simple as just. <laughs> getting in there and training people everyone has their own like uh, training programs already and so on yeah any other questions okay no? all right You go, I go. <laughs> Thank you everybody for joining us today. And to all of our speakers, you guys were fantastic. I love that we can all come together even though we all work for separate organizations, we all come together for the bigger picture. So I really enjoy working with the three of you guys. So fulfilling and I always learn something new every time. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you everyone for um, spending time with us. This is so important, an important topic. And um, thanks Matt and Patrick and Vanessa for hosting and John. So um, what up? I hope to see you in person later on this year. Yep. I thank look you everyone. To thank you so much for being here guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank Bye. you everyone. Thank Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye. Thanks.